us on social media, such as Facebook or YouTube live streaming, uh, please click through the link and join us uh, on the Zoom call. That way you can interact directly. Um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom for all of you that are on the Zoom uh, conference. And uh, feel free to ask questions all along the way. Um, of course, at the end, we'll open it up for additional questions as well. Uh, but I'd like to introduce you to Emma from Emma um, Marketing by Emma. Um, she's going to be presenting some things to us today, and I'll turn it over to her. Um, but again, as, uh, as I mentioned, feel free to ask questions along the way. Emma, you, you're on mute. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> for some, you said you're going to turn it over to me, so I didn't realize that the transa transition had taken. Hey, Emma, for some reason, I can't hear you very well. Can everybody else? Yeah, yeah we, we can hear her. Oh, yeah, we're good. Me. We're all good. <laughs> okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and I'm also going to uh, make my screen full size. So if you do have questions and I'm not seeing it, anybody can feel free to verbally interrupt me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today, but my main goal is to make this as valuable for all of you that are here as possible. So if you do have questions, I would rather attend to those than to stay on track with the talk. So truly, I have no problem with you interrupting me. Send any and every question that you may have uh, my way. So today I'm going to be talking about differentiation, which is a really important thing to be considering no matter what stage of your business you're in and no matter where you're selling. But I would argue it's even more important on a platform like Amazon, uh, is particularly after the last year that we've had uh, with so many new businesses getting onto Amazon. There's a lot of very fierce competition. And as a customer, it can be pretty confusing even to try to wade through all of the different search results and find a product that is best suited for what they need. So hopefully by the end of this conversation today, you'll have some actionable things that you can take to look at your Amazon listings or your website or whatever it is that you're focusing your attention on right now and really figure out what you can do to more strongly differentiate yourself from your competitors. So before we dive into the meat of things, my name is Emma Shermer Tamir. I'm the co-founder of Marketing by Emma. That gentleman standing to the left of me is Erez. He's my husband and business partner. We started Marketing by Emma in 2016, and we specialize in crafting conversion spiking copy for e-commerce businesses, whether that be websites, Amazon listings, and really helping businesses communicate in a way that's going to help them connect with uh, and build relationships with their dream customers. So let's all think in the mind of a customer for a moment. So put your customer hat on and then imagine that you are going to, onto Amazon and you're gonna search for a popcorn maker. Now I understand that the pictures I pulled up here are from the editorial recommendations section of the search results, but whether they're the editorial recommendations or just any other search page, for no matter what you're searching, you're likely going to have an experience like this, which is you search your main keyword and you're going to see very similar looking products, very similar price points, very similar reviews, and very similar listings. And what is a customer to do in that situation? I know for myself, a lot of times when I encounter this, I just kind of get a bit of uh, analysis paralysis and I decide that I either don't care that much about it and I'll deal with it later, I say maybe I'll go to Target and just be able to go and look and touch the products in real life, or I will look for something that seems to be good enough. Um, but, but a lot of times it, it actually scares me away from Amazon because I just find it too stressful to try to deal with this. And more often than that not, you are doing this whether you realize it or not, whether that's because you're taking the product that is outshining everybody else and using them as your sort of, um, not, I wouldn't say copy, but maybe strong inspiration for what to do, or you're just not really thinking from a perspective of not only how can you present your product, but how can you present your product in a way that makes it unique. So which one do you choose in this case, by the way? Like if you're, if you're presented with these three, 
Maybe you'll choose because the purple is the one that's your favorite color, or you like the way that the popcorn is overflowing out of the blue one, or you just go by the most reviews um, or the cheapest. So none of these are truly reasons that would make somebody want to come back to you or be particularly excited to choose you over somebody else. And that can be a real problem, especially if you are looking to really strengthen your brand and be a strong presence beyond uh, Amazon as well. Because you could very easily just fall into uh, that thing they got on Amazon rather than this product by this company that is so awesome and you need to get one also. So copying forces customers to choose based on price, on reviews, on superficial differences, or as I mentioned, just not, not choose at all. Now let's take a look at an example here. If you were getting into the uh, pet coat or more specifically dog coat business, and let's say you're looking online, you're looking for the top competitor in dog coats. This is the listing you see. And so you say, okay, this is what I, this is the guideline that I need to follow to create a successful listing because they have over 14,000 reviews. They're the number one bestseller in dog cold weather coats. They're doing phenomenally well. So let's, let's do that. Now, first of all, just again, from the customer perspective, is this a helpful listing that functions on all of the levels that it needs to function on? I would argue no. I look at this and it's very confusing. One of the things that I'm immediately sort of thrown off by is the, I kind of have it all jumbled together here for sake of wanting to make it into one slide. So in the upper left-hand corner, we have the main image and the title, and then we have the bullets on the uh, bottom left. And then on the right hand side is their A plus content. So let's actually hone in on their A plus content for a moment. And if you look at the top of their A plus content, they have used a huge portion of this to dedicated to helping people find the right size for their dog. Now, first of all, visually, this is a little bit overwhelming and confusing, but I also have a dog and I know that I would never ever take the time and effort to take a tape measure out of my drawer and to try to measure all of these different things on him. Like I just wouldn't do that. So I would guess. And guessing is likely going to lead me to choosing the wrong size or potentially choosing the wrong size. And I would imagine because they've made this the central part of their A plus content that they are trying to mitigate the likelihood of people ordering the wrong size because it's probably creating a lot of, of returns that they're wanting to avoid. So what could they do to really easily make this so that for those that want to measure, they can, but maybe for those that are a little bit lazier like me, they can find the correct size for them. I would say probably having a really nice image of dogs in all of the different size coats. So you could visually say, oh, I have a dachshund. That dachshund seems to have a similar build to my dachshund. So I'm going to go with an extra small, or I have a Doberman Pinscher and the 3XL looks to be perfectly sized. So really thinking about not just the information that your customers need, but also how it would be helpful for them to receive it uh, so that they can make an informed decision. So there are some people that may just guess. There are others that would perhaps go to the extreme lengths of measuring their dog. And then there may be others that just look at this again, get overwhelmed and say, you know what, I'm going to go to my local pet store. I know I can have them try on a few different coats and I'm sure that, that we'll get the right one and we'll be able to walk out of the store with the one that fits them. So there are not really many opportunities here for people to easily find the, the fit that's good for them. And of course, we can also look at this on a marketing level. So we have some really awkward language here of the positive wear effect and the reverse effect uh, sort of in the central part of the right-hand side. We see that adorable little French bulldog modeling, the fact that it's reversible, but uh, they wanted to really overcomplicate it with the language that they're using. Uh, we have some different numbers here, and then those numbers are down below, and that's kind of confusing. Just all in all, this is taking a very simple product and making it overly complicated. 
And that's not even to, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I'm not uh, exactly clear on how they had the, I assume that this is part of a product variation, but one of the things that strikes me is that they've got in the title, the range of sizes. And so one of the things I was wondering is why are they not breaking this down and having a listing for each size? And then instead of having one listing like this with every size on it, then you can you know, make sure, like you say, show, show a small dog with a small. And then if you want to look at a bigger one, look at a bigger one. So I may be missing something. Not no, I think, how I, I think it was just one listing where they have, you know, all the child variations within it so that you can just click onto the different sizes and colors, which just again, from the customer perspective, when you have all of the colors and then all of the sizes, that's a really overwhelming way of yeah. presenting things. Yeah. So I, I, I would agree with you that this is not a uh, the, just through and through, it's not a very effective listing from a, a more even fundamental space of how they've set it up and, you know, put it into the Amazon system all the way through to the way that they've chosen to approach their marketing. Uh, and yet with all of that, they are still selling well. So, you know, what we don't really know the behind the scenes of how much they're paying uh, to, to, secure this spot and there may be other things involved there, but regardless of that, they are still holding a dominance spot in this space. And it would be very simple to go in to see what they're doing. And I think the other thing that you need to be mindful of is when you see this, it could be a cue to say, okay, well, so your listing doesn't really matter because this is clear evidence that you can have a really sloppy listing and obviously nobody reads. So why put the effort into that? And to me, I look at this and I think, wow, if either this business could get it together or if somebody else that really understood how to communicate to a pet owner could come in and do a better job, they would just destroy this because there's obviously a huge demand for a product like this. And there's just all of this potential if they could on a basic level communicate things and then going even a step further because the fact of the matter is, is that pet owners treat or well, I would imagine, especially pet owners that are buying a product like this, their dog is a part of the family. And so there are some emotions that they could also be feeding into and connecting with their customers on and everything from helping people get excited about how adorable mm -hmm. their pet's going to look to even thinking about the health and safety of their animal or being able to still take their regular walks even when the weather is cold. You know, there's all of these different things here that are being just left for the taking uh, and, and huge opportunity. And it also puts them in a position which even though they have this dominant spot, it's going to be very expensive to maintain it if somebody comes in and is doing a more effective job on all of these different parameters. So copying forces you into a constant fight. I couldn't help carrying the dog theme over. Plus I just find this <laughs> picture delightful. <laughs> It requires you to most likely take lower profit margins because you're forcing people to choose based on price. Uh, you have to be really aggressive with all of your marketing and your launches. Uh, PPC, it's really this, this fight that you are constantly in to maintain your spot rather than allowing that organic traction to help build that momentum and to have something more than just the cheapest product or the top ranking product to really give your... Um, your business a, a strong space in which to be able to grow from. So brand matters. We know that sort of just as a general rule, but until very recently, Amazon wasn't necessarily giving us indications that it mattered to them. But more and more over the last year in particular, they've started to signal to us that brand is something that they see as important as well. And it's on multiple levels. You can see it within their own marketing. So I don't know if any of you were paying attention to Amazon's advertising over the holidays, but it was very brand centric and indicated to me that they were aware that they needed to do some image cleanup because all of their advertisements were really focused on all of the philanthropic things that they're doing, the way that they're 
contributing to communities, investing in education, doing all of these positive, good for humanity types of investments, which are obviously trying to change the perception of this evil behemoth that is Amazon that's trying to take over the world. So on that level, they have, they're indicating that they understand the importance of their own brand, but they're also passing and, and some of that along to the brands that are selling on their platform as well and rewarding those businesses that are investing in the branding piece. So everything from the newer privileges that you can get as a registered brand, um, they've been recently testing out also, I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, brand story module that I believe it's still in beta. And this isn't a fantastic example of it, but this is a module that would go across all of your listings and you see our story, how we got our start, what makes our product unique, why we love what we do. If that's not an indication of brand matters, then I don't know what is. And I think that this is also speaking to the issue that they've been struggling with of counterfeit goods, of products that are not meeting safety um, specifications and all of those different things. And so they understand that if they are going to continue to maintain such a dominant spot in the e-commerce world, that they need to be a trustworthy place for people to do business. Because um, even, you know, like I, we work with tons of Amazon sellers, but I know as myself, if I'm buying a product that I need to really rely on, I sometimes have a little bit of hesitancy in shopping on Amazon, especially if it's shopping from a brand that I don't know. And that is because I've definitely had experience where something has arrived and it was totally not at all what I thought it was going to be. Uh, and I think that many people, if they've spent any length of time shopping on Amazon, have had a similar experience. And so it's really, really important that even if your products are great. And even if your brand is reliable, people are bringing some immediate skepticism to things. And so it's your job to really communicate that you're a reliable and trustworthy business. Uh, and so these types of things like the uh, brand story module are ways that Amazon has been working to help businesses build that trust with customers and establish their uh, expertise and authority. So what is branding? I know we've already been talking about it a little bit, but I think that branding can, can be one of those marketing catchwords that is vague and branding is many things. So more traditionally branding is things like that little logo in the right hand corner of my face. It's your slogan, it's your colors. And we typically, when we think about branding immediately, we think of those uh, kind of de design elements of a business and how we are communicating ourselves visually to the world. But branding is much more than that. Branding is the feeling that you give customers when they think about you. Branding is the packaging that you have on your products. Branding is the, the values that you have as a business and how much you really are committed to uh, ensuring that those values are held through and through. So branding is really how your business operates in the world. It is far more expansive than a few pieces of marketing materials that you create and then forget and then it's done. And so whether you're thoughtful and deliberate about it or not, you are signaling to people all of the time who you are. And so the more aware you can be of these things and how they're all working together and speaking across not only one product page, but across all of the different places that you have presence and touch points, the better job you can do at really uh, having a greater impact, building those relationships. And once again, just even covering that baseline of trust. Because if customers are seeing you presenting yourself in one way on Amazon, another way on social media, engaging in email in another way, that can really start to feel like, okay, they're just out to get my money and they're being more manipulative perhaps than they are truly, uh, you know, clearly expressing 
who they are as a business uh, and, and why I should spend my money with them. So let's look at another example here. On the left, we have Dove Men's Soap. And on the right, we have Dr. Squatch Men's Soap. So both of these are bar soap that are specifically tar targeted to um, men. Now, if you look at the bestsellers rank, and these, I don't, I don't know if this is still accurate, but these were the numbers at the time that I took these screenshots. But at the time, Dove was number 26 in all of bath soaps and Dr. Squatch was number three. I'd never heard of Dr. Squatch before, but obviously on Amazon, they are doing quite well in a very competitive category. And I think what's also important to be aware of and thinking about when we're looking at these examples is that this is soap. So this is not something that is hugely innovative. You can only do so many things to a soap to differentiate it at the product level. And so a lot of the differentiation that's happening here is actually on the marketing and branding side of things. And so when you are selling a product that is very similar to many other products that are out there, it is even more important to figure out how you can differentiate the way that you communicate or what your mission is or some combination of those types of things in a way that has a unique voice and perspective so that you're not just kind of falling into the sea of a very cliched marketing talk that is you know, completely indistinguishable from everything else out there. So looking at these side by side, this Dove is six bars of soap. Dr. Squatch is a four pack bundle, four bar set. Now this is a little bit confusing to me. I'm not sure if it's really 16 bars of soap, which would make me, I would assume that that's the case because otherwise each bar of soap is quite expensive. Uh, but regardless, let's discount that for a moment. I think it's moment. just expensive. It might just be expensive, which is even more so speaking to the power of branding because a brand that is not on store shelves that we don't have that long familiarity with is dominating by selling a much higher price point product. Looking at this, by the way, does everybody see what Dr. Squatch's logo is? It's a, it's a Sasquatch smoking a po pipe with bubbles coming out of it. So frankly, you could look at that logo and already get a very clear idea of who this business is. And you'll see as we look at the rest of the listing that they have really committed to that brand identity and obviously to a lot of success. So if we go here right, on the hey, left. We... Emma, yeah. Can you go back one slide? I yeah. just wanted to make a call out when you look at Dove, I mean, this is a traditional consumer packaged goods strategy. But when you look at Dove, I noticed visit the Dove Men in Care store. So unless this is the only Dove brand on Amazon, by doing this, you have no way to cross sell other Dove products in their store. Again, typically CPG, the brands stand on their own like this. But I thought that was interesting, you know, that again, they're, they're gonna funnel people into the Dove Men's store and I'm sure they've got lots of other products on Amazon. That is very interesting and even more interesting to think about if, you know, when there are um, like a man and woman partnership living under the same household. Yeah, exactly. The woman is oftentimes the one that's purchasing these types of products. And so if they were wanting to get her to buy soap for herself as well, or shampoo, or, you know, maybe they have kids products for children, then they're missing out on all of those opportunities, 100%. Yeah. And I think that's also a, one of the things that I still find quite exciting about Amazon is it seems so often the big, bigger brands are just creating this wide open opportunity for other businesses that really understand the platform. Uh, and because they're, they're just, you know, whether it's they assume that their, that their brand loyalty and the name is enough to stand on, whether it's that nobody really has that knowledge or awareness or nobody has the time, whatever it may be, there are so many versions of Dove out there that are making these 
really easily fixable er errors, but also mm -hmm. very good for those, those that aren't Dove uh, because they're not really that strong of competition. So if we look at this Dove um, listing here, there, there's a lot of what I kind of like to call that like internal marketing speak where on the surface it sounds fancy, but it really is not saying anything. So for example, if you look at uh, the fourth bullet, patented design with unique technology developed for men's skin. <laughs> We're speaking about a bar of soap here. This is not, you know, like I just, first of all, if it's truly this patented design, unique technology specific to men's skin, I didn't know that men's skin was unique uh, on, you know, a biological level. Uh, but also if that's true, tell me more about this because it's fascinating. And I, I'm obviously needing to be educated on soap technologies. Right. Well, we also, or, or what's the benefit? Exa exactly. And so if you look at the bullet beneath that, we have a very similar situation, <laughs> purifying microgreens. Now I read that and I'm assuming what they mean by purifying microgreens is that there's some sort of gritty texture on there in there that's providing an exfoliation element, mm -hmm. which first of all, I would want to make that very clear because not everybody wants that in a bar of soap. But for those that would be interested, again, as you, I think it was Paul that mentioned this, I want to hear the benefits. Why would I want that in a bar of soap? You know, is it that it, like, I have rough hands and so I don't make my hands much smoother? Is it that, you know, my skin gets itchy in the winter time? And so by sloughing off this dead skin and then having the moisturizing cream there, I'm going to be able to feel um, really comfortable and also not having to add an extra step in my routine to put lotion on because who has time for that? And I know that a lot of men are also pretty simple when it comes to the, these types of routines, not all men, but a lot of them, or at least my husband is, um, like, let's look at, uh, at Dr. Squatch now sort of in contrast. First of all, I need to move, um, these faces here so I can see better. As, as you would have expected in looking at the logo, they're really starting to paint a picture of how they identify as a, as a soap company or as a company more largely. So it's really playing with this idea of traditional masculinity and how a lot of these men's care products typically do their marketing, you know? So thinking of companies like Axe, uh, for example, and it's sort of using some of that language, but with a wink and a nod. So I would imagine that most likely their customer avatar is a, perhaps like a millennial guy um, who is a little bit fed up with some more traditional gender roles in marketing and would find this humorous and refreshing to see something that's uh, not taking itself so seriously. So uh, sudsification guaranteed. I think my favorite bullet that really encapsulate that is the bottom. The Sasquatch recommends it for exfoliating, shaving, manly activities such as bathing in the woods, face and body wash, hands, unhappy skin, travel. So they're giving you a lot of those things that you want and need to know about the product, but they're doing it all in a way that is um, much it's giving you something that you can start to get a, a really clear sense of who they are and it's fun and it's exciting. And to me, I mean, I'm not in the market for men's soap, but I would imagine that if I wasn't, I saw something like this and then I had a good experience, it would be reinforcing a lot of things that would make me then want to go back and reorder uh, more products from them or see what else that is that they're selling. And I was going to say to bullet number three, if you're yeah. unfamiliar with that brand, you know, they're making a really good point to call out. If you don't like it, uh, they'll give you a full refund. So, you know, support small businesses made in the USA, this kind of thing. So it, again, it's, it's, you know, tying it all together for me. Definitely. They are sort of towing the line of what is uh terms of service compliant mm -hmm. that add to cart now definitely 
<laughs> shouldn't be there. That's another one of those things whenever you're uh, looking at a competitor's listing and judging that as what you can and cannot do. Amazon is much more reactionary with a lot of these things. So just because you see somebody doing something doesn't mean that you can get away with it. And I would sure. just urge you to always be cautious, make sure that you can use something like that safely before putting it into your listing, because I don't know that it's really, that that add to cart now is doing anything um, super substantial for their sales and is, it, from my perspective, a little bit of an unnecessary risk and, and would be, this speaks for itself in so many other ways. So just sure. something to keep in mind. Yeah, Here I think that a, for me, yeah. the big takeaway there is, you know, particularly with half the people on Amazon using phones, real estate is so precious. And so, you know, making those bullets work, whether it's using search terms for ranking or communicating benefits. I mean, I even noticed the, uh, you know, consider getting two now, well, why not have a two pack with a better unit price? I mean, why do you have to use a bullet to say that? Yeah. Well, I guess in this case, they're saying one for you and mm -hmm. one for your best friend. That's, I guess, sort of a playoff of the traditional gifting uh, mm -hmm. bullet, which, mm -hmm. you know, there are certain situations when the gifting bullet works. I would agree that overall, this is not really contributing to anything extra. And there could certainly be other details here that if they were to use that space differently, I think it, it would be um, better utilized. Like particularly, there's not really one that speaks to the experience of using the soap itself. And so, you know, whether it's, um, whether it is drying or there's like any kind of hydration property there or what types of skin it could be used for. So more of that use type of question is, is left up in the air. But when you compare them side by side, you know, you have Dove on the left, who's just kind of cobbled together a bunch of, it almost seems like they took a bunch of different campaigns and we're just like, here, we'll use this sentence from here and this sentence from here and this sentence from here. And their, their bullets certainly aren't perfect, but if I'm sort of just weighing these between um, one to the other, I have a much clearer sense of this business. And just as a business as a whole, I would be more excited to be shopping from this company than I would be, uh, than I would be from Dove. Yeah, your point about the gift giving is a good one. I was not thinking about that. I mean, if this is if that's targeting gift giving, you know, I was thinking then, you know, why not even call out, assuming this is fulfilled by Amazon, that they can gift wrap it. Yeah. Yeah, there's just I this is a strange bullet. It kind of feels like a throwaway and <laughs> it's uh definitely a lost opportunity for sure. So here is Dove's uh product description. I really and love I think a know. point you'll probably make Great later story. is always making sure that did I think someone Go was ahead. talking I'm, uh, bad. Is my connection bad? No, it's Steve, I think. Steve, you're dropping out again. Just just go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, I love their brand story by Dove. <laughs> Uh, at the very least, if they're not wanting to invest in A-plus content, which I would expect that of Dove, uh, they could use some basic line breaks to make this text much more readable. Because um, I just look at this huge paragraph, my eyeballs don't know what to focus on, and I'm just like, I, I cannot be bothered to read that, even if it's the most beautifully written thing in the world. Here we have Dr. Squatch's A plus content. So again, just as you would expect from the very beginning, we have a very cohesive, clear idea about who uh, who this business is. You know, we have this uh, lumberjack looking man uh, just, you know, inhaling that bar of soap. Uh, again, very much with a sense of, of humor. Um, and I think it works overall. You know, they don't have the most amazing design. They are, haven't done the perfect job with 
all of their writing. They may have some missed opportunities with their A plus or with their A plus and their um, and their bullets. But still, overall, when you are trying to sell in a crowded space like this they understand the importance and necessity really of having a clear perspective and differentiating beyond just the soap itself because I mean frankly I don't believe Dove that they truly have a you know some innovative technology for men's skin and so rather than just try to make their product sound better than ever they've decided to take a very specific perspective and approach to connect with who their customer who they know their customers are in a way that they know that their customers will relate to and respond positively to um, you know what i'm wondering looking at this you know we there's always the you know the, we talked about benefits and then there's the features and it didn't cross my mind until looking at this you know they they are very clear on positioning you know to men but I wonder, looking at this image in the upper left, are they really kind of, is the, what they're really trying to target is, you know, so many soaps are perfumey and men don't want that. And if that's what their their USP is, I don't even think they ever say that, that this is a, a musky soap or I can't read the text. This is really small. So, yeah, it is small. Um, that's one of the things that Amazon still needs to figure out is I, I feel like even though A plus content has come a long way, it still could use some uh, improvements when it comes to the, the text and how that displays. They do talk about this. So there, this section right here says better scent and better lather. Oh, okay. Nine manly scents that produce an intoxicating, thick, foamy lather. Dr. Shower, Squatch showers are an experience, an adventure into the wilderness that will have you coming up with excuse excuses to get dirty <laughs> just so you can get clean masculine sense and glorious lather so i mean that is a pretty awesome <laughs> little section there i, I, I don't think it was in the bullets any of that stuff which is surprising so let's see it says unleash your inner man uh favorite sense cedar citrus so i guess the one that i sure clicked enough. on when doing the screenshot was the cedar citrus but yeah, other than that, it doesn't really go into the sense. At, I mean, it, you know, it mentions no harsh chemicals and some of those things, but it doesn't really so much dive into the scent itself in this. Or the experience. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. It almost makes me wonder if these are sort of older and then when they got brand registry or they maybe worked on their A plus content and at that time they didn't think to go back and rethink their bullets, which happens a lot. And overall, you know, the other piece about branding is it's not this static thing. It's not like you are clear about who your brand is and then it's a, you know, set it and forget it, done, cross that off the list. Just like people, your brand is going to be constantly evolving. And so perhaps these bullets made sense at the time that they set them up, but already they had so much more valuable information and insight into things when they created their A plus content. And then if they were already going to look at their, um, at their listing, why not give that extra little bit of effort and time into thinking about how they can make sure that there's really a cohesive story going on and that they're mm -hmm. touching on all of those important parts. And I definitely think that that experiential piece is missing from the bullets and would make them much stronger. Yeah. So who is your brand? Uh, as we saw with this um, example, your brand may be the only differentiator. Dr. Squatch is not the only handmade soap. It's not the only handmade in the USA soap. It's not the only handmade in the USA soap with, you know, masculine scents. And I would even wager, I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is that there are also very similarly scented soaps that already exist uh, out there. So the, those really are not their differentiators. Instead, their branding piece is that thing that is helping set them apart from a Dove, from an Axe, or from any of the probably hundreds or maybe even thousands of soaps that are being sold on Amazon right now. 
So what messages are you sending to your customers, to your partners, to your team? Uh, you know, it's not even just what's happening outside in public, but uh, in closed doors as well. Because if you're, if there's a disconnect between what you're saying you're committed to externally, but then you're not reinforcing that with your team. And so then they're not carrying that over into their interactions with customers in the world. Then again, that's where you can get that disconnect and, and a potential for a mismatch. And it's not that customers are going to be looking at your listing or a piece of marketing with a magnifying glass being like, ah, that seems off. But it may just be enough that it creates a little bit of a weird fe feeling. And it may not even be one that they are actively aware of, but it's just enough to maybe take a little pause to feel like something's off. And for whatever reason, you're potentially um, creating an opportunity for a little bit of a loss of trust, loss of attention, or um, that lack of um, really like strong, clear messaging that could, could really um, have a strong impact on your business. Being clear about what makes you just different, uh, very clearly communicating why people should choose you over the comp competition, making sure that you're really controlling the message. All of those things are things that you really want to be thoughtful about and that you want to be revisiting from time to time and then thinking about how you can translate those into your marketing. Now, the other thing that it's that this is really helpful with is in a business, you're most likely delegating to other people, whether you're outsourcing it or whether you're hiring people. And so the clearer that you can be about these things, the better job that those people that you're hiring will also be able to execute your vision. Because if you're not clear about what makes you different um, or what, you know, how you want to be seen by the world, then it's giving a lot of potential right answers to the people that are doing the work. And so the more that you can really hone in on that, the it, it narrows it down so that they're more likely to be aiming at the same target that you are with whatever project it may be. Yep. Very quickly, if anybody has any questions out in the audience uh, for Emma, please feel free to put them in the question section. I know she really encourages and likes to uh, interact uh, that way. So, uh, so please go ahead and do that. Thank you, yes. Shoot as many questions as you would like. So build trust. This is something that we've already touched on, but it's very, very important. Uh, you know, trust is definitely easier to build in uh, in-person types of interactions, but we don't really have that luxury online and just in the world right now. So you want to be making sure that you're doing as much as you can to both build trust and also limit opportunities for a loss of trust. So let's look at another example here. This is a wireless Wi-Fi camera. So it's a little hidden camera that's disguised as a USB um, charger thing that you can plug into the wall. And you know, so if you don't trust your nanny or you're out of town or whatever. I would say that this is a product that requires a very high level of trust for a couple of reasons. One is because customers are going to be counting on it when they are likely have something at stake, you know, so if they're, if they want to make sure that they can truly trust the person that they're giving access to their home, then they need this product to work in order to be able to monitor and see whether that's truly the case. But there's also another level of trust here that I don't think is immediately obvious, which is that you're giving this company access to the interior of your home or wherever it is that you're plugging this in. So you're not, it's not just that you want to make sure that this works so that you can monitor your house or space, but you're also wanting to make sure that you can trust this company to use your information uh, in a way that is, you know, uh, ethical. So there's there this this is definitely a high trust product. Frankly, I'm surprised that they've sold any products at all because their listing is terrible. All of those underlines are just awkward phrasing, poor grammar, uh, weird sentences, and they also just leave a lot of gaps of inform information. Um, remotely viewing the live footage through the app, 
This charger hidden camera work with an app which can help you remotely view the live footage. So this is a perfect way for you to secure your home. I mean, it's just, it's, it's truly hard to understand what it is that they're even saying here, especially if you're considering that a lot of people are doing more skimming and quick reading than a, a thorough, careful analysis of every single word. Um, they such a brilliant design. I really love that they're complimenting themselves <laughs> on their ingenuity, <laughs> which we can laugh at that. But I will say that one of the temptations that I often see with clients is this desire to want to call everything like kind of like what Dove was doing also the the most innovate innovative the very best sort of this over the top language and you want to be really careful with that both because it can very easily just fall into overhyped cheesy marketing territory but also because anytime you're saying that you need to truly be able to live up to it because otherwise all you're doing is creating a mismatch of expectations. And that's one of the worst things that you can do. It's not about making any sale. It's about making the right kinds of sales. So you don't want just anybody to buy your product, but you want the people that are going to be a great fit for your product. You want them to buy it. You want to minimize the opportunities for returns or for, you know, dissatisfied customers and obviously an opening for negative reviews as well. So you want to be really thoughtful and not just be saying, okay, this sounds good, or this makes me seem like I, you know, like I'm the most trustworthy uh, business out there, but always try to take a step back and ask yourself whether that's true. And that's something that's helping push your message forward, or if it's maybe even just massaging your own ego a little bit. Here's their A plus content. This is truly all of the A plus content that it has. So it's some sort of nice looking pictures and a little bit of text that is telling me what is included. Uh, needless to say, there are a lot of questions that I have looking at this, uh, everything from how it works to, you know, how the, how long of clips it records and what types of, Hmm. It doesn't even mention whether there's audio or not. So I don't know if this is just recording video or if there's sound also. I mean, hmm. be before even getting into the deeper question of, do I understand what the benefits are and why this is the best product for me or why this Hanbu brand is the brand to trust? I don't even have that basic level of understanding this product through and through. So there's sort of like a hierarchy that you want to be thinking of. And, you know, while we talk about examples like the um, Dr. Squatch and they have this really thoughtful um, branding and, and copywriting that they're utilizing, that's great. But before that, you also need to be communicating on a basic level what your product is and what those need to know facts are. Uh, because also, if you're going back and thinking about the customer experience, most of the time, what we're doing is before we dive into whether it's reading reviews, looking more deeply at a listing, is we're asking ourselves, is this the product I'm looking for? Does this meet the basic criteria that I have as a customer? So, you know, in this case, I would want to know it has the little app store and Google Play. So it suggests that it's compatible with um, iPhone or or Android, but it's not coming outright and saying that. Typically when I'm buying um, any kind of technical product, I wanna know that it is truly going to work with my device and my version of that device. So those are those kind of need to know details before going uh, anywhere else. And so it's very important to understand those, to communicate them, and then build on top of that with things like branding and um, benefits and really understanding uh, what you can do to differentiate your product. So establish a trusting relationship. Be clear, be consistent. Of course, always use impeccable grammar and spelling, um, which also means that even if you are writing something yourself, you should always have at least one other set of eyes 
uh, on anything that you're sending out there. I know I can even fall into that trap of sometimes I just want to send a newsletter or something and I'll do it. And then of course, whenever I don't ask somebody else to look at it and I'm a professional writer, I, I always catch at least one mistake. And I'm like, if I would only have slowed down and asked somebody else to take a look at this, avoid exaggerated claims, think about who shouldn't buy your product. And if it's really a very clear who shouldn't buy your product, then you also want to make that uh, easily identifiable on your product page. You know, maybe it's even something where um, your, let's, let's go back to the dog coat, for example. I have a long dog. I mentioned that I have a, a dachshund. Um, so most coats are actually very short on him. They only cover the first half of his torso because he's so long, which that's not really a very helpful coat if I'm trying to keep him warm when it's freezing cold outside. And so if that coat isn't going to be a good fit for, you know, it's not only dachshunds, there are plenty of other long dog breeds, then indicating that on the front end would be very helpful to know so that all of those owners wouldn't, um, you know, wouldn't find themselves in a situation or perhaps what it means is that you should size up in that case. Uh, and again, it would just be helping to really establish clear expectations on the front end so that you can avoid um, negative situations on the other side of things. And then always being aware of trendy marketing tactics. So, you know, you uh, you can go online and find everybody telling you to do everything and, you know, why TikTok's the best, why P Pinterest is the best, why you should be writing things in this way, why you should be, you know, using these kinds of images. And there may be some very good reason behind any of those particular um, tricks or, or tactics. However, you always want to assess them from the perspective of your brand and who your customers are and make sure that it makes sense for what you're trying to do. Um, because if not, then again, it can just seem as more of an over eagerness to make a sale rather than really um, having your customer's best interests in mind. So be bold. So you may know what makes you different, but then you have to commit to really uh, following through with what makes you different. So in the event of uh, Dr. Squatch, they, they went there. They really ran with this idea, but they could have easily said, okay, well, we're going to play with this idea of traditional masculinity and, and, you know, we're kind of going after this millennial man that's maybe lives in a larger city and, you know, they have their, their customer avatar fully built out. But then at the last minute they say, but you know, really any man could use our soap. And actually any woman could too, because a lot of our fragrances are very gender neutral. And that fear or that lack of commitment to what they've really decided to on is their perspective and who they're going to be selling to is what can make um, really strong marketing become very diluted. So you really have to commit. This is a great example. I also see that we are getting close to three. So I will try my best to speed this up, but I think this is a really uh, important example to speak on for a moment, which this is not on Amazon, but this is a company called Allbirds. They are a sustainable shoe company. I think they've recently expanded into other um, types of products as well, but shoes are really their hero product and what allowed them to um, reach the place that they have as a business. And they did something really interesting on uh, Black Friday last year, which is rather than offering a crazy sale, which by the way, Allbirds, I've been a fan of theirs for years and I've never once seen them offer a sale. Uh, so rather than offering a sale on Black Friday, they decided that they were going to raise their shoes by $1 and they were going to match that dollar and donate those $2 to a organization for um, helping with climate change issues. And Obviously, this is more than just donating a couple of dollars. It's really making a clear statement about uh, how they feel about things like Black Friday and, you know, that consumeristic uh, made up holiday and that they weren't going to participate in that. What's really interesting is if you look at their social media, 
there were a few people that didn't get it, that maybe they weren't fans or they just liked the way they looked, but weren't necessarily on board with who the, this brand's full vision, uh, who were like, you know, it's been a hard year. Couldn't you at least give us a sale on Black Friday? And Allbirds didn't even have to step in to answer those questions because they had tons of other fans replying saying, you obviously don't get it. And also <laughs> they've donated it a lot. And so they, this I'm sure was not an easy decision to make. And there were probably disagreements before they decided to launch this campaign because it is a little bit edgy, um, but it is very true to who they are as a business. And I saw this and I'm a fan of theirs and it made me only respect them further to see something like this. And I would imagine that it did a very similar thing for their core customer base. So even though it may have turned a few people away, I think overall it helped them achieve something that was pretty uh, significant in strengthening those relationships with their customers. But again, it wasn't easy. They really had to say, okay, this is who we are. You know, we don't give sales. We don't believe in in needless spending, and we're going to kind of uh, do a little bit of a, a pushback to the idea of Black Friday. So, you know, I just was going to say that. Yeah. I mean, it it makes the point of how you talk about an avatar. All of that, what you just talked about, is a good example of how important it is to do personas before you do creative because I'm sure that they know that their core customers, you say, is not always buying on price. They have values higher than saving money. I'm sure they had a good understanding of the customer before they made this type of decision. Oh, 100%. I mean, they're not overly technical shoes, but they have the price point that I would say is not a super expensive shoe, but they're around the $100 mark. Right. You know, So if you're, lo- if you're comparing it to uh, a sneaker that, you know, by New Balance or Nike, I would say that their nicer shoes are around that price as yeah. well. Um, and so they understand that people are buying this because they source their wool from New Zealand farms that are, you know, um, treating the sheep well, and they have this special material that they make out of the soul, the souls out of that's much more carbon neutral than, you know, other types of materials. And they like, that is what people are buying into. And on top of it, they're incredibly comfortable shoes. And I promise that this isn't an advertisement for all birds, but they, they <laughs> are really comfortable. You can wear them without socks. Uh, so anyway, they're, they're very, but you're totally right. They, they understand who their customers are. And it's through that understanding that I think they were able to be able to do something this confident with their marketing that people I think would be um, pretty hesitant to do otherwise. Yeah. So understand your brand, be clear about what makes you special, make it really clear from the get go. Fight that choice paralysis that we were talking about and really invest in building a brand, not just a business. So the last point that I want to make before we wrap up today are benefits, because we've kind of been talking about that a little bit, and it's not directly related to branding, but it is such an important part of having a successful piece of um, marketing like this when you're writing a product page that it's worth spending a few moments talking about. So I have another side by side here. On the left, we have Intex. They're a um, very large outdoor products company. You can find them places like Walmart. And on the right, we have Splash Easy. Splash Easy is actually a, um, a company that we work with that, and we helped launch this product now just around two years ago. And they've done phenomenally well. Uh, you'll see photos of the product in a moment, but on the surface, these products serve the same function. So they're both kiddie pool type of products. Uh, Intex is a more traditional kiddie pool, whereas Splashy, so this is what the Intex pool looks like. And then Splashy Z, you can see some photos here where it's, um, it has these little like sprinkler things that it does. And it's, so it's much shallower than a traditional um a traditional kiddie pool, but again, it's still on the surface, a way for children to be able to cool off safely in the summer months. However, what Splash Easy has done 
very uh, interestingly here is they've kind of taken this blend of a clear identity of who they are as a brand with a very strong understanding of benefits to make a very, not only persuasive case for why this is a product that people should buy, but also um, why, what they've been looking for, like they've almost created a new category for themselves by doing some very basic adjustments to the product itself. So one of the main sort of different differentiators that they have is they have a um, different patterns that are printed on the bottom of the pool. So there's one that's alphabet themed. There's one that I think is sea animals themed, um, I think space, and I can't remember what the other one is. So, you know, they're kind of these just cute patterns, but because they've added that, they have turned them also into an educational tool. So now we have this hybrid of cooling off plus education, and they're thinking about from the perspective of education, um, really this like child development piece and having a very clear understanding of what parents are going to be caring about when they're purchasing a product like this. Because that other thing that you want to be considering, and I know I'm sort of interrupting myself with different ideas, but this is a more obvious example of the end user is not necessarily the one that's making the purchasing decision. Sometimes it's a little bit less obvious, like when you have the soap and it may be actually the woman in the household that's buying that and then the man is the one using it. But you always want to be making sure that you're aware of who's making the purchase and if the person that's using it is the same person or not. Uh, and that may impact how you approach things. So in this case, you know, perhaps they will be getting in the pool with them and they'll obviously be supervising their child, but it, they're really thinking about how this product is going to be a good fit and a safe fit for their children. So talking about make learning a blast, um, thinking about this splash safely. So because it has those little sprinklers and it's really shallow, there's less of a risk of drowning. And so when we're thinking about benefits, the thing that you want to do is you want to ask yourself, why does this matter? And then you want to keep asking why until you get to a really uh, strong understanding of what the emotional driver behind something is. So in the case of Splash Safely, uh, we're talking about the safety element, uh, the design of this product. And obviously, or maybe not obviously, the concern there is that the the parents don't want their child to get injured or drown. You know, we're talking about pretty scary types of things. Now, in this case, with that kind of emotional driver, you don't want to just confront that head on. You don't want to say, scared of your kid, you know, having a severe injury or drowning or, you know, whatever, that would be going too far. But having that in mind and then being able to provide some reassuring um, text so that you're, you have that uh, understanding of what people are concerned of, but you're managing it in a more delicate way is, is sometimes that balance that you need to take. Uh, and then we have a, obviously a little bit of a or maybe not so obviously, less of a sort of strong emotion of the learning through play in the fourth bullet. So here's talking about, okay, in this case, if it's learning through play, so you want your child to have fun, but you're also really thinking in this case about setting your child up for a happy life and a good future. And so connecting with that concept uh, in a way that is going to be motivating to people. So here's in Texas, uh, A plus content, leaves a lot to be desired. We just have one photo here, a lot of uh, question marks as to, I don't even know whether this comes with, a, with something to inflate it or if I need to provide that myself. Mm. Um, I believe there's even a mismatch here. It says 18 gallons, no. I don't know. Yeah, 18 gallons and then 22 gallons. So we're, there's some confusing uh, basics, again, that are being forgotten. 
Whereas here with Splash Easy, we see lots of lifestyle images, people interacting, they're helping you imagine the experience of being outside with your child in the warm months and to be thinking about all of the ways that this product can not only be a fun summer activity, but can also help to foster some of these different skills that um, you may want to be working on with your children. So this is, um, it's taking a rather obvious product and through both a little bit of product design, as well as really understanding how benefits impact the uh, purchasing decisions that we make, they have achieved phenomenal uh, success and they've gone on to launch many other products and as well um, through, you know, some, some relatively minor changes. So again, it just goes back to that idea of both having a very strong idea of who your customers are and who your brand is, and then figuring out a way to uh, bridge those two through strong communication. So build excitement to buy. Who are your customers? What do they care about? What gets them excited? Then find that benefit and keep asking yourself why it matters. And then it's not to disregard the features like what we were speaking about earlier of um, that hierarchy of importance. Uh, it's to know what your features are and to really use them to support whatever benefits you're, uh, you're presenting about your products because they are important. It's just that if you have two sentences and one is our uh, product is made of polypropylene and I don't know, I'm put, putting myself into a corner with this sentence, but anyway, and you're just saying our product is this and measures this length versus you speak to the strength and durability of, of this material because it's made of polypropylene and whatever, and that that's going to uh, pro provide a safe place for your children to play that has much more substance to it. And it's not that people don't understand on an inherent level why those things are important, but you want to be thinking about the experience of your customer again, sort of in summarizing all of this, which is that they're opening Amazon, whether it's on their computer or on an app on their phone, and they probably have a million different things that are pulling at their attention. And so even if it may seem obvious to you, spelling it out makes it more likely that they're going to draw the conclusions that you want them to, rather than leaving it up to chance and perhaps missing out on an opportunity. So can really crazy by getting curious. Uh, we I would love to offer all of you a free listing analysis. Uh, so if you either go to marketingbyemma.com slash prime guidance or scan this QR code with your phone, that will take you to a link to fill out a short form and then we'll follow up with you uh, with some of the things that we notice sort of similar to what we did earlier by looking at some of these examples and pointing out what we feel uh, you may be able to do to make a stronger and more persuasive listing. And here are my contact details. I am happy to answer questions. I guess people were too shy to send them here, but if you have questions, you can connect with us uh, through our website, email, uh, phone, or Facebook, and we would be delighted to answer questions or help in any way that we can. Nicely done. Yep. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, um, if you have any questions, please take a moment. Of course. That was great. Um, i tell you what, since we are pretty much out of time, um, if you do have questions, just shoot them over to us uh, via email or reach out to, to Emma directly. And we'd love to make sure that all your questions get answered. Um, so thanks again, everybody. We'll see you here next week, same time, same place, Thursday, 2 p.m. Central Time. Thanks, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.